Hey guys, what's up? So the question I want to pose to you today is, is C-sharp as a language dying? So I, I was actually looking at a few charts and everything earlier today, and um, it made me wonder whether or not C-sharp has actually peaked as a, a programming language. Um, C-sharp has been around since uh, .NET was first introduced in the early 2000s, like literally like right at the turn of the century there. So um, .NET, uh, or Microsoft came along with the, the .NET platform and then they, they, they created the first revision of C-sharp as a uh, programming language that was going to be able, that was really built to use Microsoft's .NET library and tools and everything. Um, so if you look back at those times, I mean that's before smartphones, um, the internet was you know, obviously already popular, but uh, we didn't have the whole web 2.0 thing, so it was uh, pre-MySpace, pre-Facebook, pre so it's kind of hard to envision an internet that didn't have those, um, you know, those types of platforms, but um, those were the, the, the times that we were looking at, right? So um, a lot of people were, in, uh, a lot of Microsoft programmers were used to, to using WinForms and building uh, GUI apps, like software apps that, that you download and install on your Windows platform. Pretty much everything had to be developed from Windows because uh, even now Microsoft has dominated the operating system market for personal PCs. Um, so, you know, a lot of the web developers, or really not web developers, but a lot of, a lot of programmers were using uh, WinForms. So, what Microsoft did is they created the ASP.NET framework, and the ASP.NET framework was a web framework, but it had a bunch of web tools that were kind of built for the old .NET um, GUI app type of thing. So when um, when you when ASP.NET came out, they had this thing called Web Forms, and Web Forms uh, allowed you to build websites using the traditional you know software development tools. Like, and if you've ever done GUI development, it's never very fun. In fact, uh, you know, from being a web developer and doing GUI development, uh, I've never had a, a real good time doing that. Um, so, I find it you know relatively involved, and um, and, and they're really two different things, right? So. Uh, being a web developer, you're more interested in HTML and CSS and JavaScript and how all that stuff fits together. Uh, with software uh, applications, a lot of event-based systems and stuff like that, a lot of uh, background workers, thread processing, thread management and everything uh, in order to build a sleek, fluid um, software application. So with the tools that were introduced with web forms, they had things like data grids and, um, and, and, and button controls and all these different controls that Microsoft had. And, really just a terrible, terrible experience um, if you've ever done that. But it's supposed to make web development easy, but the problem is the tools never work exactly the way that they're supposed to. There's a lot of black box Microsoft magic involved. And, um, it, you know, just long story short, it's it's really not the, the, the best, you know, tool for the job. But anyway, a lot of people love ASP.NET. It gave rise to MVC.NET. Uh, MVC.NET is still a popular option, obviously. But one of the things I want to mention is that if you look at, like, uh, the Tiobe index just this month for the month of June. Now I, I know that the Tiobe index is not um, the end all be all for uh, the discussion of whether or not this truly is the best programming language. I mean Tiobe looks at a lot of different search engine traffic, a lot of different things to determine what they feel are the most popular languages. Um, so they, you know, they, there is no exact science to this thing. There's no exact answer as to what the the best language is. Uh, but but TLB is kind of the industry standard as far as like if you were going to try to cite a source. I mean, TLB is like the source that you would cite for like 20 years running now. So it's not even not even close. Um, so with TLB, though, like, like I'm showing you that they um, they just recently announced in June, the June results that Python had surpassed C sharp. Now, I believe I had a video, an older video that that was talking about whether or not Python had surpassed C sharp. And I think it did for a moment and then C sharp took it back. But um, now, according to this chart, Python has a pretty significant advantage over C Sharp, and I think that's interesting because uh, a lot of C Sharp developers will tell you, "Oh, that's you know, Python's this you know this indie level, uh, beginner level you know stuff that 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 you know that companies are are only using, and you know it's basically a fad, right?" But it's hard to really equate Python as like a fad when Python's been around for twice as long as C Sharp, and uh, and, and is still going strong after all this time. Um, Python was the, the tool of choice for Google when they were getting started with their search engine. Um, so the original Google search engine was all using Python. Python, they needed something faster eventually, so they wrote, rewrote a lot of their libraries in C++ from what I understand. But um, I, I believe they are still using uh, Python pretty heavily. Uh, but So the real, the real question is, is, is Python really a more popular language now than C Sharp? 
And I don't really know that I have the answer to that, but what I do want to mention is that there are a few charts that seem to indicate that C-sharp has, like, maybe not decline, and maybe it's not in, like, a full uh, decline mode, like Pearl or something like that, or Pearl was, you know, um, I think they're kind of having a resurgence lately with Pearl 6, but um, I don't think it's, like, full-on panic mode, but I do think that, that C-sharp and that there's signs that C-sharp may have peaked in popularity. Um, and that would have happened about two years ago or two or two or three years ago. Um, so if you look at what does Microsoft do really well, like what would C sharp programmers do? C sharp C sharp programmers are writing Windows applications. Um, Windows, I tried to push the whole WPF technology in order to write Windows applications, and and that didn't really catch on. So WPF is kind of a dying thing. They tried to do Silverlight. Silverlight was supposed to be, um, you know, the way we view videos on the web and. Now there's HTML5 video, and, and nobody really wants to use Silverlight. They don't want to use Flash Player either. So, um, you know, we're seeing Silverlight falling flat on its face. Uh, the old WinForm stuff, I, mean, I suppose that's still being used to some extent, but people aren't really using that all that much. Um, where else is Microsoft? Okay, so they're in the cell phone market, right? But nobody likes the Windows Phone. I mean, nobody's using the Windows Phone over an Android or an iOS. Um, so, you know, it's a distant third place there. So. You can't really use C Sharp for mobile development. So what did Microsoft do? Well, they went out and they bought the Xamarin Studios. Xamarin Studios was a um, was built by the former Mono guys, including uh, Miguel de Casa or something, whatever his name is, from Mexico. He was a self-taught developer, I believe, but really a, good, a great developer, a great hacker, a great advocate for open source technology. But he was the one behind the Mono project, primarily, of being able to take C Sharp, which was closed source proprietary code that you didn't have access to, and not just C-sharp, but the .NET library, and then open source it, basically make it so that it works on uh, Linux, Mac, and, and all that stuff. But the problem with Mono is it was always like two steps behind the .NET framework because .NET would come out with some new thing, and then the Mono guys would have to adapt to the new thing in order, you know, with, with no help from Microsoft for the most part as far as being able to make that uh, available in the Mono framework. So... So if, you, so if you look at that, right, so because Microsoft hasn't been able to compete in the cell phone market, they went out and they purchased Xamarin. I, I don't know what the, the full price was, but I'm pretty sure Xamarin was valued over a billion dollars. Uh, and they, they went out and they purchased it, right? So they purchased it because they needed to have a foothold in the mobile market because <clears throat> people were writing native Android apps, <clears throat> excuse me, in the Java programming language. And then you had all the Apple iOS stuff was being written in Objective-C and now Swift. So Microsoft needed to be able to compete in the mobile market since they didn't have a mobile phone. Even though they tried to buy Nokia and all that other stuff, they still couldn't really brand this Windows phone as like a, a legitimate option for developers. So they bought Xamarin Studios now in Visual Studio 2015. Xamarin Studios is included. Uh, but um, even when you try to run that stuff, you get all these runtime errors and stuff like that. So, you know, I don't know. That's a, that's a review for a different day. But, um, but obviously, that's why Microsoft's trying to stay relevant as a C-sharp language. And I think, why are they doing some of these, these things? And I really think that some of this is being done because of the fact that the hacker community and the, and the newbie developers are not embracing .NET. And it seems like they really never have. But people wanted to learn .NET. They wanted to learn C-sharp because that's where money was. That's where the jobs were headed and everything else. But now if you have things like the Tiobe Index um, that's showing you that, that a, a language like Python is becoming more popular, and then you have like JavaScript, right? You, people are writing web apps with JavaScript on the front end and back end. Now granted, Node isn't a, a programming language, it's a runtime. It's a runtime library written in C and C++, but you write and you interact with it using JavaScript. So you can write JavaScript on the back end, and it's great. And then you can also write it on the front end, so you only have to deal with one language. The problem with that, though, is that the uh, Node.js framework or library or runtime library is not very suitable for all the CRUD applications that we deal with. And create a CRUD is create, uh, update, um, delete. So create, read, update, and delete. So that, you know the typical web website development stuff. Node's not well suited for all of that. Node's well suited for two-way asynchronous communication back and forth. It's non-blocking, so that you know it doesn't really bogged down. But ultimately, if it's hitting up a database or something like that, or making a database reader, anything like that, it suffers from the same problems that any other framework would suffer from, whether it's MVC.net or Django uh, or Ruby on Rails or whatever it is. So, so with 
you know, this, this uh, you know, with, with Node being a, a viable option, we're seeing less and less developers jumping on this .NET bandwagon. I really think that there's a, there's a, you know, there, there's a specific crowd out there that is like, why do I need to do .NET? Why do I need Visual Studio? Why do I need all these Microsoft tools when I have free open source technology that can just run on the front end and the back end? So I know what everybody else uh, on the .NET side is going to say about all that stuff. They're going to say, oh, but, but .NET, the, the newest version of .NET and .NET Core and ASP.NET 5 is, is, is open source and it runs on both Linux, Mac, and Windows. But here's the problem. .NET Core is just now getting released. They've been talking about it for like two years now. Um, and .NET, 1. Or .NET Core 1.0 was just released, and that's great that they're trying to make these you know, these updates in order for it to work on Linux and stuff like that, but there's no database driver that exists for MySQL or Postgres. So when I tried to use it for an application not that long ago, it wasn't a viable option. There, there was a built-in web server that you're supposed to set up, or it wasn't even built in, but it's called the Kestrel web server, and that wasn't even ready for prime time either. So it was really weird because, like, we're supposed to be, like, they're touting .NET Core is here and all this other stuff, and, and it's, like, way in advance of anything ever being supported. So, you know, even up until like a few months ago, it wasn't really a viable option when it comes to running a website. So if I'm actually looking at a website, do I want to do a .NET website in Azure and pay a ridiculous amount of money to host my, my .NET website in Azure? Or do I want to use something like Django, which has everything I need right out of the box, including the admin and authentication and all that stuff, and install it on any sort of shared host or... Uh, a virtual private host like uh, Linode, I always recommend Linode, it's a great company, that's where actually, actually where I host my websites. Literally like $20 a month has brought me in 250,000 visitors in a month. Um, and that's not even scratching the surface of, of what it can actually uh, do because I didn't even use like more than 15% of my resources. Um, but with but with you know all these options, like why would you want to use Azure? Well, Azure makes life easy, right? Because you're not going to have to pay a bunch of network administrators to set up your server. There's elasticity where you can have servers set up on China and and uh, and, and India and South America, and you don't have data transferring across cables laid on the ocean floor. You know what I mean? If your server, like my Linode server, is out of New Jersey, so for the most part, if somebody's requesting it for, from China, all the data packets is going across the Atlantic Ocean, probably to London or somewhere, and then eventually getting dispersed to Asia, or maybe it goes the other way, I have no idea. All I know is that there's cables under the ground, and that's how data is being transmitted on the web. Unless it's mobile, but it's not gonna be mobile, I don't think. So, uh, in fact, it wouldn't be mobile. Unless somehow, like, my cable is, is transferring to some data center, and then some of that's being sent up to mobile, but I seriously doubt that's the case. But anyway, that's a, that's a subject for another day. Um, but the the data there um, is arriving. So, like, if you need to be respondent, uh, you know, in real time to all the different people across the world, then you're going to want to use something like Azure. But then you're like, okay, well, Microsoft has Azure, so Azure's you know great. You can do C sharp, and you can write, you know, but you can also do Node and Django and everything else, and host it in an Azure environment as well. So you're like, oh yeah, well, C sharp can dominate there, right? Well, with C sharp, I mean, they have currently about nine percent of the corporate. Um, cloud environment for environment, you know, for Fortune 500s and things like that that are actually setting up their operations in the Azure cloud. Um, but Amazon AWS has like 40% of the market. So Microsoft is a distant second place in that regard, although they are making a lot of money. That's a cash cow for them. Microsoft still makes a ton of cash. So, um, you know, C Sharp isn't going to be dead overnight. Like Microsoft makes a crap load of cash, like literally like $22 billion a year, maybe more. I don't even remember what it is. It's some ridiculous amount of profit. They make it based on their operating systems, which are installed on pretty much every personal PC out there. They still make a ton of money on their Office products like uh, Microsoft Word and Excel, and that, that's going to continue to bring in a lot of money. They make a lot of money in education. Uh, they're obviously making a lot of money in Azure now. They're making money in uh, Xbox and stuff like that. So Microsoft has a ton of cash to compete. In fact, when you talk about the biggest... IT companies in the world, you're going to mention Microsoft, Google, uh, Amazon, and probably Oracle. Those are like the four humongous companies, right? And there's there's a lot more besides that, but those are the four that that you're going to talk about a lot. So is C sharp dying, right? There's a lot of indications that that would m make me think that you know the new uh, the new CEO at Microsoft, Satya Nadella. 
you know, he made a lot of changes like open sourcing a lot of Microsoft technology because they've traditionally been closed source and, and the hacker and the newbie communities don't embrace that. Um, so I think part of that reason is because they've seen the direction of Microsoft. They've seen the uh, the demand for their tools and their programming languages decline amongst newer programmers. And ultimately, these newer programmers are entering the scene. They're going to be the future of programming. And we're seeing all these Silicon Valley startups and stuff like that where eventually or where it used to be an edge case. Oh, that's just some hipster hacker that used Django for Pinterest. And, and that's a terrible idea, but that's not the real world. But you're seeing Netflix and Walmart.com and um, uh, Instagram, all these major sites, they're using things like Django and Ruby on Rails, and they're using uh, Python, they're using like Yelp, uh, Reddit. They're using um, you know even corporate environments like uh, Walmart.com is using Node.js. So um, Node.js isn't a fad, you know. I mean, it, it it works for a lot of people, and and I think Microsoft seen the writing on the wall, so they started open sourcing their stuff. They've started working as fast as they can on trying to get no uh, or uh, the the .NET Core 1.0 out as quickly as they can, even though it's not really a feasible option for the reasons that I've told you before. Um, and they're and they're doing that, but because I think that there is a noticeable decline. If you look at the um, the the uh, the actual stats for GitHub, which might be the most telling actually of all stats when it comes to whether or not a language is popular or not, um, the the most common repositories that are being created and the code that they use, you can see it's JavaScript, it's Python, it's Java, and then C Sharp is like way down there, you know? So there's like, there's an entire, there's a lot of C Sharp developers that are like nine to five developers that aren't hacking away at home and stuff like that. They're not trying to expand and push the language forward. They, they could care less, right? They, they get paid to write code for some major enterprise during the day. They know the Microsoft way of doing this, that, and the other, but they're not really like, going home and like pushing the envelope of what the language can do where when you compare something like that to you know like the python environment the you know python's got all this like contribution and support coming from all these different industries and it's not all based on a company it's mostly private and you know personal support that's being poured into these frameworks and and libraries and everything and i think that's relatively impressive so even if you have a language like python which is a dynamically interpreted duct type language which is never going to be as fast as a compiled static language like C++ or C Sharp or Java, but it can still save you a tremendous amount of time and, and, and the, 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 you know, the, the amount of code that you have to write in order to get things off the ground. If you have good community support, it means you're going to have a lot of community support when it comes to questions that you may have or plugins that you may implement to, to push your agenda forward, whatever it is that you're working on. So there's a lot of options there. I think that GitHub um, stat really tells a lot about where, where the language is. Um, and then, you know, beyond that, like if you look at the trends on Indeed.com for ASP.NET and C Sharp, both of them are, are declining pretty, pretty significantly. So um, while there's still a lot of jobs in C Sharp and .NET and, and arguably a lot more jobs in C Sharp and .NET than there are Python at the moment um, or even Ruby, I, you know, I don't know if that's going to continue. I mean, with, with the way trends are going, I mean, it would seem like you know, Java, C++, uh, Python, you know, even C Sharp, probably even in, in our entire lifetimes, like there's going to be a lot of support for, for C Sharp. Um, and Microsoft, you know, it's going to be interesting to see what they do. But, um, you know, I think that there's pretty good indication that, that, you know, the language has peaked as of about two years ago. So if it hasn't peaked, it's definitely in a, a goalie over the last couple of years even with all the effort that Microsoft's pouring into trying to make themselves relevant in the different areas where they just can't compete or where they haven't been able to compete thus far. Anyway, guys, let me know what you think. Uh, please subscribe to this channel. If you like this, uh, definitely subscribe because it helps me out. Thanks, guys. Bye.